You're listening to New Talk on WNSR New School Radio. Madam C.J. Walker was a noted African American who contributed to the fabric of our country. Contributing to the Harlem Renaissance movement and beyond, she helped foster what we now know as African American culture. Well known for her hair care products, she dedicated her life to the betterment of others. In this exclusive interview, I spoke to Alelia Bundle, Madam C.J. Walker's great-great-granddaughter, who talked with me about Madam Walker's life and legacy and her contributions to society. I would like to welcome Alelia Bundles to WNSR New School Radio. Thank you, Ms. Bundles, for agreeing to do this interview with me. My pleasure. Uh, can you please uh, tell me about Madam C.J. Walker's upbringing? Well, she really is a great American rags to riches story. She was born Sarah Breedlove in 1867 in Delta, Louisiana, on the same plantation where her parents had been enslaved before the Civil War. She was the first person in her family born free, but she was born into uh, great deep poverty uh, with very no advantages, really. And by the time she was seven years old, both of her parents had died. She was left an orphan in the care of an older sister. But she said she got married at 14 to get a home of her own because her brother-in-law was so cruel to her. So she married a man named Moses McWilliams. When she was 17, she had her only child, Lelia, who later became Lelia Walker, the joy goddess of Harlem's 1920s, uh, according to Langston Hughes. But they started out there, she started out her life very, very poor. And by the time Sarah Breed Love McWilliams was 20 years old, she was a widow with a young daughter. She moved up the river to St. Louis, Missouri, where she had three brothers, older brothers who were barbers. And she spent the next uh, decade or so really as a poor washerwoman. But uh, her hair began to fall out, and uh, she developed an ointment and a shampoo so that she could have healthier hair, healthier scalp, so that her hair would grow back. She began to sell that product, and by the time she died in 1919, at age 51, she had become not just a millionaire, but a woman who employed thousands of other people, who was a philanthropist, a political activist, and a patron of the arts. Well, that's amazing. Uh, Talk about um, some of her philanthropy work of political activism. Well, you know, I think that it is absolutely amazing, of course, that she became an entrepreneur who became a millionaire at a time before women even had the right to vote uh, as a a self-made woman millionaire. But it was very important to her, I think, because of her great faith and her early involvement with the African Methodist Episcopal Church, where she was even in the Missionary Society when she was a poor washerwoman. She knew that she had had a lot of blessings, and she wanted to give back. And she that came in the form of many things. She actually she loved music and theater, and this may surprise many people, but even when she was a poor washerwoman in St. Louis, when she was in the church choir, she was around people who were classically trained. And so that love of music uh, in, in a city where ragtime was born and in a city where African Americans performed opera, she carried that forward and really took great delight in introducing young African American uh, musicians and actors and artists and writers to her circle of friends. And she also was very involved in the NAACP's anti lynching movement. She had grown up in Delta, Louisiana, in an area where there was a great deal of racial violence. None that I am aware of that affected her family directly, though she certainly was in an area where other people were affected. And she was part of the executive committee that planned the 1917 silent protest parade in New York uh, where 5,000 African Americans marched up Fifth Avenue to protest the recent uh, riots in East St. Louis. She contributed $5,000 to the NAACP's anti-lynching fund in May of 1919, just before she died. It was the largest gift the NAACP had ever received up until that time. And just a couple of her other notable contributions, $1,000 to the building fund of the Black YMCA in Indianapolis, large gifts to Tuskegee Institute and to Mary McLeod Bethune's, uh, what now is Bethune-Cookman College, but then was Daytona Normal, and to a number of other African-American educational institutions and uh, community institutions. So she really was quite conscious of using her gifts to help her community. 
Yeah, going back to her early beginnings, what were some of the struggles that she faced as she was trying to get this business off the ground? Well, she was really an uneducated woman. She had to learn to read and write. It was just as basic as that. But she was very fortunate to have been exposed to the middle-class women of her church, of St. Paul AME Church in St. Louis, and they began to give her a vision of herself as something other than an illiterate washerwoman. So she used those lessons and hired a personal tutor once she became Uh, when she began to become a bit more affluent and once her company became more successful. So she had the the easy, the initial obstacle of being uneducated. Uh, And then she was a woman at a time when women couldn't even own property in their own names in many states and when women didn't have have the right to vote. She was going up against men who uh, didn't think that women should be working outside the home, even though large numbers of African-American women were doing so. She was a black person in a segregated world. When she traveled, uh, often she was forced to sit in the Jim Crow cars. So she had all of these obstacles. At that time, there was no small business administration to uh, help you get a loan, and banks weren't necessarily lending to to African Americans and certainly not to women. So she was just a a resilient woman who pushed through. I'll tell you that she uh, was a member of the National Negro Business League, the organization that had been founded by Booker T. Washington, and he was ambivalent about Madam Walker. He was not really a big fan of hair care products, and he thought they were uh, for straightening hair. Madam Walker tried to convince him that, that was not her goal. It was having healthy scalps and uh, growing hair, and so she had to fight a bit with him. She wanted to be um, included on a program at his 1912 convention, and she arrived at the convention ready to speak and to share her stories with the other two or 300 African-American businessmen and women who had been former slaves or the children of former slaves, and he denied her that opportunity on the first couple of days of the convention. And when she saw that she wasn't going to be given the opportunity to share her story, she decided to seize the moment. And the final day of the convention, as the last banker was completing his remarks, Madam Walker stood up, looked at Booker T. Washington at the podium, and said, surely you're not going to shut the door in my face. I'm a woman who came from the cotton fields of the South. From there, I was promoted to the wash tub. From there, I was promoted to the kitchen. And from there, I promoted myself into the business of manufacturing hair goods and preparations. I have built my own factory on my own ground. The next year, he invited her back as a keynote speaker. <laughs> I love it. Uh, you just uh, reminded me of some of the myths associated with Madam C.J. Walker. I saw on your website um, uh, there was a question, did Madam Walker invent the straightening comb or the perm? Uh, well, and you're, and you're pretty you emphatic asked. about saying, no, she did not. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, those those are myths that have uh, have developed through the years. The hot comb myth came up, and I, you know, and I will say during her lifetime and during the the time when my family was associated with the manufacturing of, of hair care products, some of the older people who had been at the company for years and years absolutely were totally against chemical uh, straighteners. They said Madam Walker would never have done this. In terms of the hot comb myths, Madam Walker did use the hot comb. She certainly uh, pressed hair, but she was not the inventor of that. The hot combs and metal, heated metal hair care implements have been around at least since the early 1870s, and I doubt that she invented something when she was a toddler. But I think that myth developed because she was a she did use the hot comb. She thought it was an improvement over some of the other items that people use, like pullers, kind of like flat irons now. She thought those flattened the hair, and she thought the comb separated the strands and made the hair look a little bit less uh, pressed down. But I think the real myth came about because after her death, one of the um, men who had supplied her with combs died, and his widow needed money, and she sold his patent to the uh, Walker Company. And I believe that maybe the employees of the company just said, we own the patent, and people think we she invented it, so we're just not going to argue with that. <laughs> yeah, I would like to uh, pick your brain on a couple of subjects. Uh, one of them is uh, the fact that there is currently this big dichotomy between those who have and those who have not. Uh, and uh, there are some who believe 
the way to solve that problem is to tax the rich. Uh, your great great grandmother being one of prominence and, and of wealth, what do you think she would feel about uh, taxing the rich to help benefit those who don't have? Well, you know, it's such a it was such a different time when she right before she died in 1919 was really when the income tax was introduced. So people who were making over five thousand dollars, I've seen this in some of her correspondence with her attorney. Uh, were going to be taxed for the first time because before that there was not a federal income tax. So she was one of those uh, early people who was going to be taxed. But I think, in, in, and as I say, this whole idea was new. She was giving back a large portion of her income in contributions. When she died, the estate, the Walker estate, was setting aside two thirds of its profits to for a trust where the money would be given to charity. So I would think at that point, given the reality of that time, she would have thought, well, I'm giving away so much money, I'm giving away more than I would be taxed. But I, it's a totally different set of circumstances now where the tax laws have been written to benefit very wealthy people and to protect that wealth. So she, I think at that time she would have said, I'm giving that much money away anyway. She, I believe today probably she'd be in the Warren Buffett uh, camp and say, you know, we should we should give our money away because that's what she was doing anyway. Now I want to move to a different subject, and this is more of your opinion. Uh, what do you think of the fact that a lot of our young people in particular uh, are not aware of many important facts about history, even with Madam C.J. Walker, uh, the fact that she contributed to the Harlem Renaissance? A lot of people don't know that. Well, it's, if you don't know your history as people always say, then you will not really understand who you are, you won't understand your power, you won't understand your influence. And it is really tragic to me that we are losing, so many of our young people um, are losing the ability to understand where they came from. You would think, on the one hand, there's so much more information out there because so much of history is digitized, but we don't even know, many of our young people don't even know our recent history. There are lots of people trying to make sure that our young people are learning history, but the curriculum today is not focused on history and social studies. It's focused on teaching to the test with math and English. But our children really need to learn that. So I guess we have to teach it in at home, and we have to teach it in church, and we have to teach it in our community organizations. Uh, I was on your website, and I didn't realize that just because you – uh, a biography uh, reporter of Madam C.J. Walker and you are her great-great-granddaughter, that a lot of people expect you to be an expert in hair. <laughs> and uh, so there are questions on your site like, my hair is falling out, what can I do? Mm-hmm. Um, is that something you're fascinated by, if, you know, just because you are you know, you write on someone or you, you know a lot about their history, that you too are an expert in what they were an expert in? Yes, people expect you to be an expert on the person that you write about. And being a biographer means that you should be an expert on the person's life. You aren't necessarily an expert on their expertise. I think a biographer really tries to look at the uh, dimensions of the person's life, the motivations for their success, the ups and downs of their lives. And in the case of writing about Madam Walker, I try to look at what inspired her, how she inspired others, what the obstacles were that she overcame. But I'm not an expert on hair. But I did grow up in a household where both of my parents were executives of hair care companies. So by osmosis, I know some things. I grew up going to hair shows. I spent a lot of time in beauty shops. I listened to my parents' conversations. But my dream in life, my passion in life, was not to be a person who manufactured hair care products. My passion in life was to be a writer, and I'm really fortunate that my parents wanted me to follow my own dreams. And so I spent 30 years as a journalist learning how to be a good storyteller, and I spent time as an executive understanding how corporations work. So I'm able to bring that expertise to the telling of the story of my great-great-grandmother. But just because of my affiliation and association with people in the hair care industry in my own household and then through the rest of my life, I do pay a lot of attention to this industry. It absolutely fascinates me that African-American women are still so invested and so sort of in some ways 
over-occupied with our hair and why it is that um, as a child of the 60s when I, I went through the stage and through the phase in, in our lives as African Americans where everybody straightened their hair prior to the 1960s to this phase when we had afros and when it was okay and accepted to have natural hair to a phase where we are now where many people have natural hair and are comfortable with it, but we still have really a majority of African-American women for a variety of reasons who are not comfortable with natural hair. And it's not to say that if you perm your hair there's anything wrong with it. I'm not the hair police. But we are um, very uh, invested in this sort of sort of battle within ourselves about whether our natural hair is okay and acceptable and whether we have to conform to more European standards of beauty. What do you think? You know, I, as I said, I'm not, I'm not the hair police. <laughs> and, um, and I have had my own uh, evolution in terms of hair. I mean, I grew up, absolutely had to, you know, had my hair pressed, when I was, you know, I had, we had an event to go to, and I might, so that my hair was pressed when I was a little girl just a couple of times. I didn't, it wasn't really the hot comb that was in my house, but my dad was president of a company named Summit Laboratories, which was one of the, um, you know, largest, most successful uh, African American companies that manufactured hair straighteners and, and chemical perms in the late 1950s, early 1960s. So Summit Laboratories, that where my dad was president, along with companies like Johnson Products and Softsheen, were the largest companies developing uh, and manufacturing chemical straighteners. So I went through that phase. I remember getting a perm at 12 years old because I was going to take swimming lessons, and my mom thought that would make it easier for me to comb my hair uh, if I had a perm. And then I went through the phase in the late 1960s where I got an afro, and I, you know, it was a big battle in my house because my dad said, this is how we put food on the table. How, what, what am I going to say when my daughter doesn't have her hair straightened, but I was, you know, very politically conscious, and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to have that pride. I wore an afro for many years, and then in my 20s, uh, I went sort of back and forth, back and forth, and I finally got to the point where I did not like the way my hair felt with a perm. It just felt kind of unnatural and straw-like. I just didn't like it, and so I'm a person who's wore my hair short uh, and natural for many, many years, um, but I'm. But I. I think for young women, it's a. It's a totally different um, mindset, and there are different pressures. They are feeling the pressures of, you know, are the boys going to like me? Uh, what do the boys see in the videos? Uh, do I have, Should I look like Beyonce and Rihanna? And so I think we're we're constantly going going to go through this phase of um, women, especially young women, being particularly self conscious about what. Guys think uh, is attractive, and then some are going to say, "I'm I'm comfortable with my natural hair," and some guys are comfortable with that. But I think the pressure is um, going to be towards people having straight hair, and you, you have to sort of work that out in your own psyche. All right, uh, what kind of things do you have coming up down the pipeline? Uh, I know you have the family archives that you're doing, uh, and you have a book that you're writing on your great grandmother. What else is coming down the pike? Well, I'm a board member of the Madam Walker Theater Center in Indianapolis. We are celebrating the 50th anniversary of Langston Hughes's Black Nativity. The other National Historic Landmark that's associated with Madam Walker is Villa Lawaro, her home in Irvington on Hudson, New York, in Westchester County. She built that house, also designed by... Um, uh, architect Bertner Tandy, who designed her townhouse in Harlem. And uh, that uh, building is a, is a National Historic Landmark, and the current owner, Harold Doley, an African-American investment banker, is very much interested in trying to have that home become a part of the National Park Service, one of the properties that they manage. So we are working on that project. The block on 136th Street between... Uh, 7th Avenue and Lenox, the old, uh, and what's now Malcolm X uh, Avenue, is uh, going to be dedicated in the spring as Madam Walker and Alelia Walker Place. So we're real excited about that. I'm writing a biography of 
Madam Walker's daughter, Alelia Walker, and trying to show just how much a patron of the arts she was and how much she influenced the social and cultural scene of the Harlem Renaissance. Items from my Madam Walker family archives are in a number of traveling uh, museum exhibits, and uh, I will eventually be donating many of the items from that collection to the new National Museum of African American History and Culture at the Smithsonian in Washington. Cool. Well, uh, so with that uh, being said, I thank you for uh, taking out the time to do this interview, and I wish you all the best with your future endeavors. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. All right. Bye-bye. This is Roy Paul for WNSR New School Radio.